Now we have speed. It's on speed. Can't be speeding. Perfect. So another major challenge for the legal industry are the geopolitical developments. We are seeing a world which is becoming more and more fractured. From a, a globalized world to a multipolar world, we see the US-China trade war, we see Brexit, we have to deal with that. So these are both challenges and opportunities. We are living in a world of incredibly rapid change, which under the rules of Moore's law is doubling in speed almost on a daily basis. So how do we not only keep up with that, but within our industry, be leaders in that area? That is a key, key challenge. Now there's many other key challenges facing our industry and ours and our firm. You know, there's a key challenge for us of, which has to do with innovation, with new entrants. There's the challenge of That is why Christmas 2019 feels like a distant memory, a different time. Because 2020 brought about the biggest change to our collective routines in living memory. So where was I in December 2019? So I had not long returned back to the firm. I had just taken my second maternity leave. I was very busy from a work perspective. We had lots of kind of interesting transactions on at that time. Of course, looking forward to Christmas and also starting to think about the next stage in my career. So beyond being a senior associate and looking to kind of start the partnership process and what that entailed. So going back to December 2019, I think my daughter probably about nine months old then. We just got back from a trip to Hong Kong and Australia. So we went to see my father-in-law in Hong Kong and then we went to see my family in Australia. And we sort of were like, do we go, do we not go? You know, it's quite expensive. I've been a student for ages, um, this sort of thing. And you know, it's um, so glad we did go. Basically, I've got a snowboarding slash ice climbing trip with one of my best mates in Canada. So we fly out, I think, end of December, early January. November to December is usually the busiest month in antitrust. So it was a really, really um, intense period of time for me. Also in December 2019, we got our allocations for our third seat. I was really excited because I put all my points down for a seat in Singapore, which is a dream that I had from the minute I got my training contract. And lo and behold, I got Singapore and I was so excited. For Christmas, I went to Bangladesh for my cousin's wedding and then I went to Tokyo. And I brought in the year 2020, literally in Tokyo, in the middle of Shibuya Square. And I was thinking, wow, it's gonna be an amazing year. And little did I know what was about to happen. Unbeknown to all our colleagues, on the first day of December 2019, a 55-year-old man in the city of Wuhan, China, presented with a novel form of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which would later become known around the world by a different name, COVID-19. I didn't think it was really on my radar till that sort of early February. I remember it very vividly, actually. We were in the LPC. I remember reading an article in December about, uh, about it and you know, just thinking to myself, that doesn't look very nice. And that's when, you know, we're starting to start, sort of see things getting like pretty crazy out in Asia. I saw that there was a virus in China and quite a few people had it. But I just thought, it's just going to be a small virus. It's not going to be such a big problem. You know, it will probably get to Singapore. But by the time I get there in March, like everything will have been resolved. I perhaps like others was a bit naive and thought, oh, it's all just going to be contained. We've sort of seen the outbreak of SARS or bird flu before. Probably around early February, you know, we're starting to hear this thing is growing, you know, around the world. I remember seeing the news and thinking, right, it's not just in Asia. And then it's only really when I come back from my snowboarding trip where I'm like, oh, <laughs> this, this might be something. And I had just gone away and we were in Europe um, and we had gone to 
Italy and so that was just before it really started to spike across Europe and I certainly felt kind of come February that this was escalating. The Diamond Princess, then Italy and that's when it got really bad. Then we hear about the first case here and then you know it kind of it, over the next couple of weeks you know five, six, six cases, seven cases, there was that whole manhunt in the beginning and everyone's kind of like okay well this thing is kind of bubbling up but we're not quite sure what's going on. As the virus started to spread a lot more everyone in my life was saying to me you know, are you sure you want to go to Singapore? There's, there's, a, there's a virus there. You're a lot safer here in the UK, which is hilarious now to think about it. The global nature of Clifford Chance allowed those of us in Europe to get an insight of what might be to come from our colleagues in Asia. I had been to Singapore before with my parents a couple of years before, but the airport didn't look as busy as it usually would. And that's when it started creeping in on me because when I had left the UK, the virus had not been present in the UK. So the UK was completely normal. When I got to Singapore, that was a real shock for me because I thought, wow, this is what the virus is actually doing to us right now. So what I found was even though we were in the office, half of the office weren't in because CC had already taken that step where they had decided that people would be only going in half of the time and the rest of the time people would be working from home. A lot of the other trainees that were at other firms, they weren't in a tag team. They were all going into the office every single day. So we found it quite strange that CC were the only ones that had done the tag team. But we later found out that actually CC was doing the best thing by doing that tag team so early on because the infection rates were so much lower and that's because they went in and intervened very early on. We were in the office, because um, it was our week to be in the office, and I just remember getting an email from our general manager, and she just sent around an email and said, guys, everyone needs to take their stuff and go home, we're going into a full lockdown. So we went into a circuit break and we thought, all right, it's not gonna be quite long, it's just gonna be two weeks and then we'll be back in the office. That two weeks turned into three months. <laughs> and it, you, you think about it now, and it's just like, how did time move when we were stuck at home like that? Um, in a country away from the rest of your family. But it was, yeah, it was definitely an experience. Our colleagues in the Far East had been able to share their experiences. And with the chances increasing of similar measures being taken in Europe, we needed to prepare our workforce for what was to come. So we had seen our colleagues in Singapore and Hong Kong go into kind of various states of lockdown and we were speaking to them. But I think in London, it really started to crystallise that this was becoming more of an issue in the beginning part of March. And we had been split into red and blue teams. And then there was a decision that we were going to kind of trial working from home one day. So I was in the office on the Thursday, had my trial of working from home on the Friday but had received a text on Sunday to say, look, the office is looking as though it's going to close to the extent that if you're able to continue working from home, we would suggest you work from home now. For those of you that might not remember, there wasn't any like, we're gonna lock down indications. It was like literally overnight, one day we're fine, one day we're in lockdown. The coronavirus crisis is hitting home. The Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives that the UK has ever seen in living memory. I urge you, at this moment of national emergency, to stay at home, protect our NHS, and save life. The shops are closed, the theatres are dark, the bars are shut. Rather than a step-by-step -step approach, this now feels like the government is sprinting to try to keep up with this in what is obviously an extremely serious situation. The measures will be reviewed in three weeks, but... No Prime Minister wants to enact measures like this. But at present, there are just no easy options. The way ahead is hard, and it is still true that many lives will sadly be lost. With our entire UK workforce now working from home, different people experienced different challenges, perhaps none more so than those with young children. As a firm, we needed to accommodate this shift away from our established working practices while still delivering for our clients. So what was going through my head at the time was, this is fine, I can manage this, it's not ideal. I much prefer working in the office. It doesn't seem as 
quite a smooth working from home, although surprisingly we were all adapted very quickly. But the big thing for me was, look, this is all perfectly achievable. If we go into lockdown and my childcare um, falls away, then I'm really going to struggle. My biggest worry is when they shut my daughter's school because we were then in a position that I was doing the LPC and my husband was working full time. My daughter was, she, she was, would have been 12, 13 months old in March. Um, yeah, we had no, you know, that complete loss of childcare and she just settled into nursery. We just got her used to that, then bringing her home. Um, I think that was definitely something that really worried us. We got an email um, from management, like London Central Management, basically saying, hey, go home uh, and take your laptops and we will be in touch with further information about like what's going to be happening. But in my head, I was basically like, how am I now going to be in a position to work from home for the next six to 12 months? Initially, it was very much kind of engaging with our clients around, how can we support you? What are you worried about? And so it's really just kind of, speaking to them mainly kind of around their businesses but you know they also had questions around you know how are you managing it how are you remaining in contact with your team what are you doing are you having daily catch-ups with the team are you doing it weekly there was definitely a sense of that kind of blitz spirit that everyone was in it together it was completely unknown there was an adjustment slightly to kind of how you communicated but we were still able to maintain contact with clients just in a slight kind of different way and on different topics to how we had done kind of in the months preceding it. Our teams were beginning to establish a new normal, forging new ways of working to ensure that our services were maintained. Crucial to all of this going forward would be our continued investment and emphasis on legal tech. And as a business, we encouraged inspiration and ideas in this area from all members of our teams. CC were very quick to put in Microsoft Teams. They updated all our hardware and software so that we could have that. CC just said, you know, here's your budget. Get whatever you need to do to work effectively at home. And something that I was really involved in when I was in Singapore was uh, the Innovation Academy. So it was an academy where we learned how to build a bot and we would have to somehow adjust the bot to help with some sort of legal services that CC delivers to clients. There's a huge document called Offering Memorandum that we, as trainees, had to really sift through every single time we started a deal in capital markets. And it would be a really timely, like really long process. It would be six hours of just going through pages and pages and updating numbers and dates and all sorts. The bot that we created, we made it not do the job for us, but actually streamline the process. And that in turn would be saving us as trainees a lot of time, which meant we could focus on the more substantial issues. So for the client, the bot would actually save them money, save them time, and mean that the trainees have more energy and brain power to focus on the more substantial content, to actually have a firm that listens to you and understands, wait, how can you make your job easier? Here's some really interesting automation techniques and here's a whole team of people who can teach you how to code a bot that you can then enroll out across Asia. I think that really tells you a lot about the kind of firm CC is. With examples such as this continuing to prove the value that trainees bring to our business back in London, we needed to ensure that our incoming cohort, currently in the throes of a disrupted LPC, felt supported as their path to Clifford Chance had been presented with obstacles that no one could have foreseen. Truthfully, it was a mess. I mean, it, it, and you know, I'm not necessarily saying that anyone's at fault here. I mean, I do think there's things that could have been done better even at the time, but you know, it was a mess. You know, if the first thing is, well, how do we continue this thing? Um, you know, at that time, Teams and Zoom, I mean, they were there, but they hadn't readied themselves for that. You know, the materials weren't online, and that's not even to speak about how we're gonna be examined. So it took, you know, a few weeks, really, for them to, you know, just just, just get things together in a format that, that was organized. But then they had the huge problem of, you know, you had an exam for the first week of April that was supposed to be in an exam hall. So there was a, a lot of back and forth about will it be open book, will it be online? We had a whole month where we didn't know if we could use notes or not because, you know, how are they policed with cameras? There were even suggestions that we'd be taken into some aircraft hangar somewhere and like super spaced apart in, on desks and all these really 
quite zany suggestions. So we didn't know the format and then they had to cancel them so they had longer to then organise them online and work out, make sure the papers could be put online and things. And so yeah, that was quite stressful. I mean, I think once things got sorted out, it was it was relatively what you'd expect. You had online classes, you know, you had to show up where you took attendance, then you had exams and your webcam was on and all, you know, all those kinds of rules. So that's pretty much the format. But it was certainly the gray areas in between that were the most uncertain. One thing that really stood out to me, we just got a call from someone at graduate recruitment and they just asked how we were. It had nothing to do with anything. It, it was literally just a checkup call. And given the fact that, you know, I'd never even set foot in the office, I didn't know this person. The fact that that was scheduled and all of us got that, I, I think just stands out to me as something that was appreciated. COVID-19 had been dominating the news agenda. This evening, Downing Street issued a worrying update confirming that Mr. Johnson has been moved into intensive care after his condition worsened. Its impact had been seismic, but it was by no means the only issue that required action. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Officer 987 killed a citizen in front of a Chicago uh, store. He just pretty much just killed this guy that wasn't resisting arrest. He had his knee on the dude's neck the whole time. The tragic death of George Floyd has produced a wave of protests around the world. Riots continue to spread in cities across America tonight. Tens of thousands of people have demonstrated in an eighth night in cities across the US over the killing of an unarmed George Floyd. George Floyd was pinned to the ground with Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Yeah. It's tough. You know, I remember at the time, um, yeah, it, it, it's tough. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends back home, African-American friends. My two, two of my closest friends in this country are, you know, of, of African heritage. And, you know, it's tough because we've seen it before. It's been really weird because it's like all of a sudden people are like, oh yeah, Black Lives Matter, blah, blah. Like, have you seen this thing that happened to um, <clears throat> George Floyd and all this kind of stuff? It's like, this, this has been happening for years. It's been happening for decades. It's been happening for centuries. And it's just like, this isn't even the first time it's happened. This isn't even the first time we've seen someone die televised in this in this kind of manner. The same thing happened when 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 Brown died down in Ferguson. Like that they launched a an investigation that came out and said, hey, listen, there are issues with the policing in, in this area and all this kind of stuff. But have we seen any sort of meaningful change in that jurisdiction? No, not really. So I mean until we sort of start to see legislation, until we sort of start to see people sort of, yeah, l legislating these issues and looking at ways in which meaningful change happens. And you're not looking at sort of waking up every day and seeing someone getting killed or someone getting shot. And you're not looking at sort of black people in the States being like, yeah, I don't call the police. I don't call the police because there is a chance that even though I am the person who called the police, I am the person who's going to end up dead. Like, until that changes, I mean, yay for like baby steps, but like, it's been like 500 years, right? <laughs> it's been like 500 years. Like we're, we're still not, we're still not out of sort of this place where where it's good enough. In terms of sort of like the Black Lives Matter movement, I think there were a number of sort of like firm initiatives and, and, and talks within the firm and sort of emails circulated about how individuals could sort of donate if they wanted to do that and how they could sort of educate themselves on issues. It's more important that people understand the situation and, and the reason why people are angry. Taking a couple steps back, I guess, I think one of the things that drew me to Clifford Chance over the other firms that I got offers from was the fact that even back then, from an outside view, it did seem as if they were taking more of a holistic view on diversity and inclusion initiatives as a firm. 
There was a realization by management prior to a lot of other firms in the magic circle sort of waking up and being like, listen, there is a lot of talent here that we're missing out on. One of the more interesting ways we sort of, or, or the firm has kind of gone around that, is this idea of reverse mentoring. Partnering junior members of the firm from a minority ethnic background with more senior members of the firm in bringing people together who have different ways of thinking about things. You, you get a diversity of thought as well, and that's beneficial not only to the people standing in the room, but it's also in receiving that better answer, it, it's a better outcome for our clients. The mass gatherings that had been triggered by the Black Lives Matter movement were aided in part by an easing of restrictions that were enabling more people to come together, especially outdoors. The mood of the nation was lifting. Could it be after all we had endured that some sort of normality might be around the corner? The Prime Minister has outlined measures to start a very gradual easing of the lockdown in England. It's in the diary, the table's booked. Businesses preparing to open up after months of lockdown. Now, Spain has reopened its tourism sector, welcoming British holidaymakers without any need to go into quarantine. Thanks to you, we've protected our NHS and saved many thousands of lives. And so I know, you know, that it would be madness now to throw away that achievement by allowing a second spike. Half a million people flocked to beaches in Bournemouth today. This is what the government wants to avoid. We must act now to contain this autumn surge. I'm afraid from Thursday, the basic message is the same. Stay at home protect the NHS, and save lives. Yeah, well, yeah, not, not a fun time. And I just remember thinking, why did I come back? 